Okay, we're live here with Robert Cheatham and Josh Marcus from Azavia. They're going to introduce a project called GeoTrellis. Robert, take it away, please. All right, thanks so much, Andrew. We're, uh, Josh and I are really excited to have a chance to talk about GeoTrellis and Scala and how um, we're using this to do distributed uh, geospatial data processing. Um, so I'm going to do a real quick uh, intro to uh, the kinds of projects that we have uh, that caused us to develop this in the first place. Uh, a little bit about Azavia, and then I'm going to hand it over to Josh to talk through um, uh, some of the concepts underlying GeoTrellis in a little bit more technical detail. Uh, so, Azavia, uh, who the heck are we? Um, we're a software company based in uh, Philadelphia. Um, we were really founded to uh, uh, develop advanced uh, spatial analysis for the web. Uh, we're also what's known as a B corporation. This is a, a new kind of corporate form in the United States as well as a couple of other countries. Um, a B corporation is a for-profit that um, operates with a nonprofit style uh, mission. And our mission is around uh, improving communities uh, through the application of geospatial technology while advancing the state of the art uh, through research. And there are a number of ways in which this uh, uh, manifests itself, but a, a big part of what we do is, is uh, both contribute to open source geospatial projects as well as uh, develop them ourselves. So GeoTrellis is one of those. Um, uh, a lot of our work focuses on a mix of uh, projects around land, uh, water, and people. Uh, I'm not going to focus on any one of those here, uh, but rather talk a little bit about uh, how we got into uh, developing this project in the first place. So um, I was the founder of the company. The company uh, began in, in 2000. And one of the things I had wanted to do when I started the company was to um, uh, work on uh, some of the more abstract analytical tools that I had uh, learned about in school uh, but had not had a chance to uh, uh, develop uh, in the workplace. So uh, we started the company to do that. Um, a lot of this work, as many people know who've been involved with GIS, is inspired by um, uh, first Warren Manning in the early 20th century and then more recently Ian McCarg in the 1960s and early 70s. And he wrote a book called Design with Nature in which uh, 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 planning and design processes were driven by the overlay of many different uh, acetate, uh, thematic acetate layers. So um, a lot of GIS uh, arose out of uh, uh, this kind of planning and design thinking, the idea that you could pick a particular a site for a project on the basis of uh, combining uh, multiple layers, overlaying them, uh, potentially applying weights to those, and then having a map that, that uh, guides uh, the design and planning process. Um, um, my introduction to this was uh, via a, a professor at Penn, uh, Dana Tomlin, who had written a book uh, based on his PhD thesis called GIS and Cartographic Modeling. Um, uh, Dana Tomlin uh, uh, turned this into a book in the 1980s, and then uh, just last year re-released this uh, with Esri Press. Uh, many people refer to what he developed uh, not as cartographic modeling, but as map algebra. And uh, I was enamored with this. It was a it was a very uh, powerful way to think about um, combining different kinds of geographic data, uh, and map algebra gave a framework for doing that. Uh, my introduction was uh, through Adrisi at the command line, uh, but even after I left school and, and worked in other places, um, uh, I had a desire to, uh, as, as the web was developing in the 1990s, to try to uh, make this more available uh, to the general public and be able to take these kinds of analytical uh, and planning tools and uh, make them available on the web. So as Avia started that way, uh, however, uh, it actually we weren't actually able to implement some of this. That was what my dream was, but um, uh, that uh, vision of doing advanced spatial analysis on the web was not really what people wanted to pay us to do. So for several years, we were mostly a web mapping company, and we worked with a lot of different toolkits. Um, but over the last several years, we have been uh, working toward a uh, building a generic framework that would support this kind of spatial analysis, and that's what GeoTrellis is all about. Uh, it's uh, got a couple of um, uh, important uh, uh, things that we're trying to aim at here. We're trying to improve uh, distributed uh, data processing, uh, making it easier to do this kind of work. 
uh, the big bottlenecks we found in terms of bringing spatial analysis to the web around performance and distributing that processing uh, to a lot of different machines is an obvious way uh, to uh, uh, to attack that problem. The second area we uh, found was a big bottleneck was around raster file I.O. and uh, so part of what GeoTrellis uh, the framework does is introduce a new raster file format. Josh will go into that in a little more detail. Uh, we had some early R&D supported um, by the USDA um, uh, NIFA uh, Research Institute through the Small Business Innovation Research Program. Um, this supported some initial feasibility studies around doing this kind of distributed computation. We also had some early support from the National Science Foundation to enable us to experiment with GPUs, graphical uh, processing units, uh, which have many, many cores, often hundreds of cores, uh, and enable us to, enable us to uh, work through uh, how to do this kind of chunking and, and distribution of, of uh, work. So uh, GeoTrellis, when it was uh, uh, started a few years ago, um, uh, its main objectives were on creating high performance, near real time responsiveness uh, for uh, spatial data processing. We want this with a fairly simple concurrency and distribution model. Um, uh, here, uh, again, high performance is not just fast, but fast in the service of uh, user experience in particular. Uh, so not just speeding up batch processes, but uh, doing so in a way that would enable both scalable and fast uh, web and mobile experiences. Uh, we want to make something that would be elastic, that could grow or shrink as needed. Uh, it would be resilient. It would be able to lose uh, um, uh, worker agents and be able to um, still uh, survive and be able to recover from that. Uh, we want to be able to compose multiple steps in a model to do operation changing. Um, as well as be able to play well with others. This wasn't an attempt to replace a lot of the standard GIS tools that many people may already be using, like um, uh, Oracle or PostGIS or GeoServer or ArcGIS server, but rather to uh, fill uh, simply a, um, uh, a, a fast data processing component within that ecosystem. We've got a lot of stuff already completed. We have a, uh, uh, a new raster file, as I mentioned before, an arg file. Uh, we've implemented some um, uh, many of the map algebra functions for local uh, simple neighborhoods and zonal operations. We've got support for uh, multiple types of numeric data, uh, a few vector operations. Uh, we can support uh, tiling now for very large raster data. Um, again, fast performance. A lot of what we're uh, a lot of the decisions we've made are around supporting that and then uh, a benchmarking suite to make sure that that performance stays where it needs to be. So a few of the ways we're uh, applying this uh, framework, uh, here's an example with uh, business siting, being able to take multiple factors, apply weights to those, and then generate a heat map from that. Um, simulation modeling, uh, this is a urban forestry example where we're, we want to be able to compute um, ecosystem benefit based on a number of different uh, geographic input layers. Uh, and then be able to um, simulate what will be the impact on the urban forest if we, say, plant a thousand trees uh, and what will be the air quality and stormwater and, and greenhouse gas emissions impact 5, 10, 15, 25 years and be able to do that simulation in real time. Uh, being able to support educational games, uh, this is a stormwater game we've been developing with the Stroud Water Research Center. Um, uh, being able to enable students to literally change the landscape and be able to uh, see the impact of that uh, in the digital humanities, uh, being able to uh, see and understand patterns. Uh, this is a Civil War application called Visualizing Emancipation. Uh, crime analysis and forecasting. Uh, water infrastructure planning with the Army Corps of Engineers. They're particularly interested in how uh, climate change, uh, climate uh, change velocity and other factors need to be considered as they do their uh, budget planning for infrastructure investment, uh, travel sheds, uh, and more recently streaming data, and uh, uh, carbon counting. So uh, before I uh, turn over to Josh, I just want to say I'm very excited. Uh, it's been a kind of a long journey to get to where we are, uh, but we really do feel like we're uh, finally able to support this kind of advanced analysis on the web. and. Um, uh, not just be able to work on land, water, and people uh, projects, but be able to really support simulation 
uh, modeling and forecasting. So I'm going to turn this over to Josh, and he's going to do a little bit more of a dive uh, into uh, the, the GeoTrellis framework. Hello there. Um, my name is Josh Marcus. I am um, the technical lead of the GeoTrellis project, and I work here at Azavia. I'm going to talk both about the sort of design and the, um, the technical reality of GeoTrellis, as well as talk about some of the issues in distributed uh, analysis of geospatial data more generally, since it's sort of a, um, a broad topic that I think a range of developers um, are grappling with or are going to need to grapple with. Um, so GeoTrellis is a distributed real-time geoprocessing library. So what does that mean? Um, it basically means that it's, uh, when we say real-time, I basically mean that it's fast. When it's distributed, I mean that it can spread the work out over multiple machines. And as a geoprocessing library, it can um, analyze or transform geospatial data, which is either in the either uh, vector data, points and polygons and lines, or it is raster data, which is uh, a data grid. Um, because I cannot resist immediately overcomplicating, um, I'm going to throw up some caveats and asterisks. Um, so the first asterisk is on distributed. Um, uh, so distributed processing usually means spreading out work over multiple machines, but actually um, GeoTrellis is built to parallelize on a single machine um, just as much as it is built to distribute across machines. Um, when, the, when there's a single task that uh, takes too long and the computation is too hard, but we want it done very quickly, sometimes really the goal is just to get it done, to, to use the full power of a multi-core machine to get it done, um, whereas distribution allows us to, um, to scale over large data sets. Um, Real time uh, can mean a range of things in computer science. Um, in this case, I mean real time in the sense that it is used in the big data community. Um, so in, um, the Hadoop system is an example of an important project in the um, big data um, space. And it is a batch processing system. Um, there's, you have a large data set. It already exists. And you just want to be able to complete some computation on it. Um, and you don't really care if it takes a minute or two minutes or an hour. Um, but there's a new category of systems that are often called real-time systems. Um, they're focused on low latency. They're focused on immediate response to questions to make interactive experiences possible or to allow analysis on evolving data sources. Um, it is a uh, geoprocessing library. It's a general purpose. It supports both vector and raster operations. But really, our focus has been primarily raster, um, because there are some existing libraries that are um, quite strong in the computational geometry uh, space. Um, and it's a library. So it's a software library the developer can use to, um, to build software with geoprocessing capabilities. But it also can, includes a runtime, um, a, a server that can actually distribute the work um, in a cluster of machines, um, if you've load, loaded the software up on um, a, sort of a, a set of machines. Um, and there's also a server that makes it easy to deploy and run web services. And it includes um, a small admin interface. And as we move forward, we're implementing more and more um, services that uh, work right out of the box. So um, for getting a look yourself, um, there is a documentation site at geotrellis.github.io. Um, and we've put a lot of effort into um, fleshing out this documentation site. Um, there are uh, a range of um, getting started uh, sort of walkthroughs. Um, there are overviews. Um, there are also um, some, some blogs that we have written that are quite useful. Um, there's also the um, programming documentation um, and other resources to get you started. Um, the code is up on GitHub. Um, uh, you see that uh, github.com slash geotrellis. And there are also some additional um, uh, projects um, on our GitHub repository that also might help you get started. Um, so I just want to talk about 
the way we use it technically and the way it integrates with other um, mapping applications or other applications. Um, one of the most common ways that we have used GeoTrellis is to build what are called WMS services. Um, my colleague, Adam Hins, has a um, great blog which sort of walks through the process of building a WMS style service. Um, a WMS stands for Web Mapping Service. It is a web endpoint. It's a standard um, where a client, say like a, a web client, makes a request for a map image to show, um, perhaps on a web page. Um, and uh, using uh, JavaScript libraries like Leaflet um, that already have support for WMS services, it's as simple as just giving um, a URL to where your service is, and you can add in some extra parameters to drive geoprocessing operations. Um, and so that's just important for if you're a developer looking to understand how you use this in your own applications, um, it's a good place to start. Um, we often will build REST style web services. So it's a web endpoint where um, some client application can ask a question and will get an answer um, perhaps in the form of JSON or some sort of machine readable format. Um, and so this, this right here is uh, the um, educational game that allowed students to model um, uh, rainfall and runoff um, and allowed them to change the land use, um, sort of like a SimCity um, in, in their area. And so um, the, the, the client application can ask GeoTrellis to run the model and then GeoTrellis will send back the, the, the response. Um, we have done a WS services which allow us to send back data in a, um, a format like GeoTIFF that uh, spatial tools can uh, process and read. Um, we've, we've integrated with GeoServer which is a popular um, open source map rendering um, application which allowed GeoTrellis to use the data sources directly. Um, more recently we've been doing work uh, with streaming data. So this here um, is a screenshot of an application that simulated uh, uh, visualizing and analyzing um, 911 calls in Seattle sped up at 30,000 times speed. Um, and sort of dealing with and analyzing real-time data is one motivation for uh, sort of having performant, scalable geoprocessing. Um, and another thing that we've been working on really in the last month is um, using GeoTrellis for uh, machine learning, um, specifically uh, predicting um, where events may occur from past um, event data. Um, and talking about machine learning is a much sexier way of talking about generating CSVs, which then can be processed by machine learning systems. But it is an interesting use case of transforming sort of point data where events happen into raster data um, where um, various analyses can add additional context for machine learning algorithms. So technically, um, it, it is a, uh, the software library is written in Scala, which is a programming language which runs on the JVM, which is the Java Virtual Machine, um, which is uh, primarily used for running Java applications. And that means that we can use Java libraries, um, which is very useful because there's a, um, a lot of geospatial libraries that are quite powerful um, that run on the JVM. Um, and there are many good things about the Scala programming language, um, but there's sort of two main reasons why we chose it for building um, a geospatial analysis system. Um, Scala is, is a object functional programming language. Um, what that means is that it combines two different programming styles. It com uh, there's an object oriented style, which um, many software developers are going to be familiar with, as well as a functional style. Um, so I'm going to sort of try and define functional programming uh, in 30 seconds, um, but there's a lot to be said, and um, you can find a lot of information online about it. But um, fundamentally, in, when you're programming in the functional style, um, functions can be arguments to other functions. Um, and if you program in Python or JavaScript or Ruby, you're familiar with this, and you'll have seen uh, functions called map or reduce that sort of uh, are very useful for this kind of construct. They allow you to take a function and apply it to some data and some context. Um, in functional programming, um, often what you end up doing is you chain together functions kind of like a flowchart or a data processing pipeline. Um, and because we are literally building a data processing pipeline, that model is um, 
really very attractive. Um, a critical restraint is that functional operations, they don't modify data, they tend to create new data, um, it, which basically means that it avoids side effects. You have a function that has well-defined input and well-defined output, um, and uh, I'll talk about in a few minutes why that's really useful for um, thinking about and allowing a system to think about parallel processing. Another uh, thing that drew us to Scala was the commitment of the Scala community to the actor model. Um, the actor model makes it easier to reason about concurrent programming. Um, concurrent programming here, I just mean both distributed and parallel programming. Um, there are many things that are challenging about thinking about uh, your program when you're doing uh, parallel processing and a lot of challenges around debugging issues that can come up because so many of the issues come up are implicit in your program. They're sort of hidden in the interaction uh, between different lines of code that were never meant to interact. Whereas, so um, where there's a traditional model of, of shared memory, um, a, a traditional strategy for doing parallel processing programming called shared memory, where different parts of your program, different processors, different threads can interact with the same bit of memory uh, and make changes at the same time. Um, in a different model um, or different strategy called message passing, the parts of your program that run at the same time explicitly pass messages back and forth. Um, and those messages don't change, um, are immutable. And what this does is it turns the, um, the parts of your program that interact uh, during parallel processing into an explicit uh, piece of the program that, you, that then makes it easier for you to reason about and test and control. Um, and this is an example of um, s some of that in using the um, ACA uh, library. Um, and you can find more about it at ACA.io. Um, in the first line here, we define a message that gets that could be passed, and that message has some text associated with it. Um, we say here, actor, bang, exclamation point, and then we create the message with the text high, and that's sort of a fire and forget, an asynchronous call where we send this message to this actor. And then somewhere in this actor, we would have this method receive, um, and this is uh, what we see down at the bottom is what's called pattern matching in Scala, where we take what's coming in and we, we test it against these various patterns. And if we received a message, that we do something with it. So I just want to take a step back for a second and talk about distributed and parallel computing more generally and um, what the implications are for uh, geospatial data in particular. Um, so what we're the problem that we're trying to solve here with parallel and distributed processing is that there's some sort of computational work we want to do and it takes too long, right? We want, we want to do it faster. And the general solution is that we're going to try and share the work either um, across machines or across cores and single machine, but in some way share the work, um, do it at the same time so that it gets done more quickly. Um, two general strategies for um, attacking this kind of problem are task parallelism where we think about what are the different steps that we need to do and can any of them be done at the same time. Um, another strategy is data parallelism where we look at the data that we're working with and we think, hey, can we chunk it up? Can we divide it up so that um, we can do the same thing on each chunk at the same time? Um, so let's think for a second about um, a data transformation pipeline. Um, so in this diagram, we start with data on the left. Um, so it's three different data sources, and you can imagine that there's more of them. Um, that, that, that data is transformed by some process. This is sort of like a flow chart. Um, so each of these data, um, the, each of these data has a process that transforms it or analyzes it. We combine the results of those processes, and then we render the, the output in some way. So let's try and take this sort of abstraction and bring it into GIS. Um, so imagine we have some number of raster data sources, um, and then we're going to weight them, by which I mean we're going to multiply each value by some number. Um, we have some polygons. We're going to buffer the polygons or do some other sort of transformation to, to come up with a study area that we care about. Um, then we're going to uh, combine those data sources. So let's say we're going to 
average the cells in each of the rasters that are within these polygons, and then we're going to render it as some sort of output. Maybe it's an image that we can see. Maybe it's JSON that describes a histogram. Um, and try and uh, bring that to life a little bit, I want to look at a, um, uh, an actual like small demo application that is up on our GitHub site. Um, so this is a application um, developed uh, with the uh, University of Chattanooga in Tennessee. Um, it's an agriculture and forestry value model. Um, it's designed to be part of a um, long-term planning uh, process. Um, and what this does, it allows sort of a resource inventory for a particular area and to compare areas. Um, so what we have here on the right is uh, various um, what, are, what are raster layers that represent um, the presence or absence of some sort of resource or some sort of land use type. And based off of the, the model that we care about, we can, uh, we can change the weights. Um, then we can draw a polygon that would represent sort of our analysis area. Um, I mean, these could also come from a database or these could be computed. And then what gets generated is um, a score. Um, and the score um, has to do with the number of cells representing the presence within the study area. And we sum them up and we multiply them by the weight. Um, and then we divide them by the total number of cells in the area. Um, and right, and so what we, so this is sort of a similar uh, process to the one I was describing um, in the slides, where there's where there are raster layers, we're weighting them, we're multiplying them together. Um, there is a, a polygon, and then we're doing summary that combines all of these things together. Um, so coming back to here, um, uh, let's think about this in the context of task parallelism. There are these three different data sources. There are these three different data sources, and uh, we can execute them at the same time. Um, because when we start combine, um, we need to have the results of those three. Um, uh, so there's no reason why uh, we can't do that. And we know we can do it because, because the operations are sort of in this functional model where they do not have side effects. Um, there's no reason why we can't, we, we can't run one before the other. Um, and you can also think about this in terms of um, uh, uh, the way that like in a math equation, um, like you see here, like A times B plus C times D, um, the two sides of the equation, they commute. You can, sw you can swap them. And in the bottom here, we have val X equals foo A plus bar B. Um, you know, while in normal programming, uh, process, you would just execute them. Um, in this case, we, there's no, we know that we can run them at the same time because they, the results are going to be entirely independent. Um, and so here is some actual GeoTrellis code that um, would do a sort of a similar process to what we've been talking about. We load some raster data. We load a polygon from GeoJSON. We buffer it. Um, this line under combined layers in some way is uh, sort of similar to the um, map algebra um, syntax that Robert was talking about where we multiply a layer with a weight and then we add them together. Then we say, okay, give me a histogram uh, with the raster and the geometry. But we actually haven't done this work. We are constructing an operation that will do it when we pass it to the server at the bottom. And then GeoTrellis can then analyze uh, what the operation is and it knows what it can run in parallel and what it can't through this task parallelism process. Um, then let's talk for a second about, let's switch over to talking about data parallelism. When we're talking about data parallelism, we're going to focus on a single source of data for a second. So let's just focus on you know, one, let's say, raster layer and a single operation on that raster layer. The one very natural way to chunk up a raster, which is a grid, is into um, sort of a, a coarser grid. Um, sort of imagine you could take the raster and divide it up into four segments or 16 segments or um, much more. Um, and then do some sort of operation on each of the tiles independently. And then at the end, we would need to combine them back together. Um, um, one sort of nice feature of that um, is that um, there are other optimizations that become possible. 
So imagine if we are getting the histogram of, uh, of these cells um, in a grid. If there are tiles that we already know the hist if there are tiles, individual tiles that we already know the histogram of, um, any cells that are entirely contained by the polygon, we don't actually need to do any work. We can just use those histograms right off the bat and just do work around the edges and then combine all the histograms together um, at the end as a, co as a combined stage. Um, this is similar to what we can do with features of polygons. You can imagine if there was a, a multi-polygon, which, which represents um, many different polygons that represent a single feature, um, we can do what we call flatten them, which is to turn the multi-polygon into a list of polygons and then operate on each one in parallel and then combine them at the end. Um, this is the um, similar. This is the the pattern we keep seeing here is the famous MapReduce pattern, um, which has sort of transformed uh, data processing and big data. Um, uh, and these ideas of uh, map and reduce come from this functional programming paradigm, um, where we have data, we uh, we sort the data into different chunks that we can operate on. We apply a mapper function that does an initial transformation, and then there's a reducer step that combines it back together. And by defining all of our GeoTrellis operations in this sort of pattern, um, it allows us to scale um, uh, almost arbitrarily as there's larger amounts of data um, coming in because we can spread up these chunks of work across machines um, and also utilize uh, multi-core architecture and CPUs and um, uh, as we move forward in GPUs as well. Um, uh, just very quickly, um, running an operation on a cluster is very simple. Um, if you look at the second to bottom line, um, if we have a cluster, we can uh, sort of call a function on the histogram operation called dispatch, which says when you are running your child operations, the operation that you split yourself into, spread out those operations on this cluster. Um, a few quick comments for Scala developers. Um, as I mentioned, we're using the ACA actor system and clustering. Um, operations are very similar to features, um, and you can use map and flat map for composition. Um, uh, also, uh, rasters are similar to collections in a lot of ways, um, a collection of cells, and so you're going to find uh, methods that are similar to the Scala collection API. Um, one other quick comment is that uh, memory is a critical issue here. Um, while it's not a critical issue for batch processing, um, for real-time processing, we want to put as much into memory as possible because um, anything that's in memory is going to um, lead to a faster calculation than um, data we have to read off of disk. And often GIS data, while big, is not so big that there's not some part that we can usefully keep in memory. Um, and so that's another sort of overriding concern. Um, I also just want to quickly mention that there is this custom raster format uh, arg. Um, there's a Python script that can convert it that uses Google, um, which is a open source uh, da uh, geographic data transformation library. Also, the, the new release of Google supports some basic arg formats. Um, it's a very simple format that's easily extended because it's just JSON metadata alongside raw data, and sometimes it's really just the, the JSON metadata in cases where perhaps all of the values are um, a single value, like no data, or it's pointing at a tile set. So um, this is sort of a big picture architecture overview, but to get started, I just want to uh, point you at the, the our documentation site at geotrellis.github.io. Um, um, we are also... Um, Often in IRC, um, you can join uh, the channel GeoTrellis on uh, Freenode, and there's also um, a mailing list, and we love to answer questions and figure out what kind of applications you're thinking of and um, how GeoTrellis can work for you. Um, our first release was about a year ago, and we've been steadily um, uh, incremental releasing uh, new uh, incremental versions. Um, and a new 0 0.9 version is coming up soon, and we're really excited to get to a 1.0 version. Um, yeah, thank you very much. This is really exciting to talk about this, and um, we're excited to sort of see parallel processing and big data processing 
um, grow so rapidly as it has and start to really um, build interest in the geospatial community as well. Thank you, Josh. And 